In this video, I'm gonna attempt to upgrade this late 2011 17-inch Apple MacBook Pro from its stock Sandy Bridge Core i7 CPU to a Ivy Bridge Core i7 in addition to replacing the PCH on the system's board with the Ivy Bridge PCH as well, which of course is necessary to support the Ivy Bridge CPU. Now in this case, you can see I've got a mid-2012 15-inch logic board here as our donor. Um, this is, as you can see, the 2.6 gigahertz model. Um, so it's got the Core i7-3720QM on it. Of course, it's also got the NVIDIA GT650M graphics, which we're not going to be using. Obviously, we can't because the footprint is completely different. Um, and like I said, we'll be using this PCH as well. So. This isn't an upgrade that I've tried before. I have no idea if this is gonna work. Um, there's a decent chance that it probably won't, uh, but I'm willing to uh, try it on this 2012 MacBook Pro, or this 2011 MacBook Pro rather, just to see if it is indeed possible. Um, so before we begin with the upgrade, uh, the first thing I wanna do is just do a baseline performance test using Geekbench. Um, so I'll just go ahead and open that here. Once it loads up here, we'll just go ahead and run the Geekbench. As you can see, I am running a patched copy of Catalina on this system at the moment. And you can see that its original CPU here is the Core i7-2760QM running at 2.4 gigahertz. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and run the benchmarks and then resume the video once it's complete and show you the results. Alrighty, so as you can see here, the Geekbench has completed successfully, and we have achieved a single core score of 589 and a multi core score of 1933. So that's about what I'd expect for a machine like this quad core um, Intel Core i7, and uh, you can see the specs of it right there. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get this page saved so I can pull it up later when we do the comparison, and then I'll take the machine apart, get the uh, board out of it and then we'll begin the process actually of desoldering both the CPU and the PCH off of this board um, and then we'll prepare to reball those to install onto the board in this system. So with that, uh, I guess the next thing I'll do actually is just get this board on the board preheater and then we'll begin the process of desoldering the chipsets there. All right, so as you can see here, I've gotten the uh, 2012 MacBook Pro Logic Board up on the board preheater here. And of course, this is a dead board. Um, you can see the SMC here is missing, and there is other things wrong with this board, of course. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and start by removing the edge bonding on each corner of the CPU. Uh, we'll go ahead and remove the CPU, and then we'll move the board around and get the uh, PCH off over here. Um, so with that, let me go ahead and start by just removing the edge bonding. This is kind of annoying edge bonding, it looks like. All right, and now that that is removed, we just need to apply some flux to the board or around the perimeter of the chip. And then we can go ahead and remove it. All right, and now that the flux is applied, I'm gonna go ahead and increase the board temperature up to about 178 degrees Celsius. I'm gonna go ahead and get my hot air nozzle aligned here. Now the inductors around the chip here are kind of in the way, so it doesn't sit down as far as I would normally like it to, but I think we'll be okay still. Let's make sure it's nice and centered here. Hopefully that'll come off no problem. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the hot air on and get the chip heating up. And then once it gets up to temperature, we should be able to remove it. It seems like the chip is ready to come off, so we'll go ahead and remove it.
All right, so now with that removed, I'm gonna go ahead and let the board cool down uh, just a little bit so I can kind of move it around and get it in position to remove the PCH. And then we'll just repeat the same process once again. All right, as you can see here, I've gotten the board in position to remove the PCH now. Um, so we're just gonna do exactly what we did before and start by removing the edge bonding. All right, and now that the edge bonding is removed, we'll just go ahead and apply some flux to the chip. And of course now we'll just align the hot air and desolder the chip. All right, so it looks like the chip is ready to come off the board, so we'll go ahead and remove it. All right, so now that both our PCH and CPU have been removed from the board, now we'll just need to reball both of them to prepare them to solder onto the other logic board. All right, so as you can see, I've gotten the uh, CPU up here, and now, of course, the next step is to remove all of the residual solder from the chip. Uh, that way we can reball it properly. So we'll go ahead and start out here with, a, with the uh, soldering iron with some fresh uh, leaded solder to remove all the big chunks of lead-free solder on there. And then we'll use the solder wick to remove the rest of it. Alright, so as you can see, the CPU has now been uh, fully, uh, all the solder has now been fully removed off the CPU. So now, of course, the next thing we need to remove all the solder off of is the PCH. So, of course, it's going to be the exact same process. Alright, so that is pretty well clean there. So now I'm just going to put uh, both those chips in a bowl of rubbing alcohol to clean them off and then we'll be able to start the reballing process All right, so I just want to give you a little close-up look here at the uh, Completely clean chips here. You can see that all the pads are completely uniform with no extra solder on them Which is exactly what you want and as you can see I got it all cleaned up got all of the flux removed um, So we can do the look at this the uh, PCH looks exactly the same and is nice and clean as well so with that, I'm going to go ahead and get my reballing jig set up here. And I guess we'll start off by just reballing the CPU, uh, since that one will probably be a little bit more difficult than the PCH. And uh, then we'll go from there. Alright, so you can see here I've got my reballing jig ready to go. And this is actually a quite interesting of a reballing jig here, because it's got this magnetic base. You kind of put it on, and of course the chip goes in this little groove here, and the stencil just goes on top like so. And I've got one of these for both the PCH and the CPU. You can see the PCH one is right here. So, but first, like I said, we're just gonna reball the, P the uh, CPU. Um, so the first thing we need to do is start by applying some flux to the CPU and just a small amount to allow the solder balls to properly stick to it. Um, so with that, I'm gonna get the uh, flux applied and just use a little bit of hot air to melt it and then remove the excess with a paper towel. So obviously no, we don't need a whole ton there. So with that applied, go ahead and turn the hot air on and then we'll melt the flux onto the chip. Just so it turns a little bit into a liquid, make it easier for it to flow around all the pads. Once we've done that, we'll just take a paper towel and smooth it out and get most of it off um, because you don't want too much, otherwise it'll bubble up while you're trying to solder and push the balls out of their holes. So there you go, as you can see there, it's just got a thin layer of flux on it. Um, so with that done, we'll just get the stencil ready here and get the CPU aligned in the correct orientation. 
this way. And now of course with the CPU inserted, we can go ahead and put the stencil on top of it. And I actually did get that upside down because you usually want the word or the uh, lettering on the stencil to be facing upright, but it doesn't really matter. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put it in there. You can see that it aligns to all the pads on the chip. And then to hold it in place, you just place it on top of the magnetic base. Make sure it's fully pushed in. And now we are ready to start reballing. So I'm gonna prepare uh, my solder balls here, get that ready to go, and then we'll begin the process of reballing the chip. All right, so I've got the uh, necessary solder balls here. Um, this stencil uses uh, 0.4 millimeter solder balls. Um, so that's exactly what we have here, as you can see. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and just open them up here and pour them out onto the chip slash stencil. All right, as you can see, I got plenty of them on there now. So you just kind of want to tap it around just like this to get them all in the holes. That actually looks pretty good there, so let's get them all off the stencil here. And then we can actually get them back in the jar here using the little spout on the side. All right, so of course the last thing I wanna do now is check and make sure that there is a solder ball in every hole and that there are no extra solder balls on top of the stencil. So to do that, I'm just going to use a pair of tweezers and get the missing solder balls in the necessary holes here. All right, so that looks pretty good right there. So now we'll just go ahead and turn on the hot air once again and solder all the solder balls onto their pads. So I am going to hold down the middle of it with a pair of tweezers just to make sure it doesn't uh, go up in the middle and allow the balls to move around underneath the stencil. So with the hot air warmed up, we just start heating. Alright, so now that all the solder balls have melted uh, their first time here, we'll need to apply just a little bit of extra flux to ensure that they all solder down onto their pads. Okay, so that looks about good there. So we'll go ahead and heat it one more time. All right, I see one here that's not really... There we go, tapped it down in its hole there. And that looks good. So we're gonna go ahead and take the heat off of it, let it cool down for just a little bit, and then we will remove the chip from the stencil. So now that the chip has been removed from the stencil, the last thing we need to do is go over it one more time with the hot air to fully seat all of the solder balls. All right, so that looks really good there. None of the balls have merged and every single pad has a ball on it. So now we are ready to begin the process of doing the same thing with the PCH. Now, of course, I'm gonna let this cool down a bit before I try to move it. Um, but once I get the PCH in place for reballing, uh, we'll just repeat the same steps one more time. Alrighty, so as you can see here, I have successfully reballed both the CPU and the PCH, as you can see here. 
Now if I go ahead and zoom in, you can see that all these solder balls look completely uniform as they should, and there are no extra pieces that are no merged solder ball, so no two no pad that has like two balls that have merged into one on it, and it all looks perfect and same with the CPU as you can see right there. So with that, we are now ready to install these chips onto our 2011 MacBook Pro logic board. So of course, the first thing we need to do in order to do so is we need to get the machine disassembled, get the logic board removed, and get it onto the board preheater. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that and then resume the video once we're ready to desolder the original chips. All right, so as you can see here, I've gotten the uh, MacBook Logic Board, the 17-inch 2011 board, up on the preheater here. Um, so of course, just like the last system, uh, we just have to remove all the edge bonding around the chip, remove it, and then we can clean the pads and install our new chip. So we'll start, of course, like we did with the other one, by removing the edge bonding. All right, and as you can see there, the chip has been successfully removed. So of course, the next thing we need to do is just remove all the residual solder from the board, and then we can prepare it to have the new CPU installed. So in order to do that, I'm just gonna use my soldering iron along with some solder wick. And of course, first I'm gonna use the, uh, the leaded solder to remove most of it, and then go over it again with the solder wick to remove the remainder. All right, so now that we've gotten all the residual solder removed, I'm gonna go ahead and remove this burnt flux using a paper towel and some rubbing alcohol. All right, and now that that's all removed, I'm going to take some fresh flux and apply it to the board. Now I'm just gonna take a clean paper towel and remove all the excess flux because we don't need that much on there. Of course, we just want a thin layer of flux on there like so. And with that on there, or with that all done rather, we can take our freshly reballed CPU, as you can see I've got right here, and you can see the footprint does indeed match uh, the CPU from, or the uh, Sandy Bridge CPU here. So we'll go ahead and take our CPU, ensure that pin one is correctly aligned. Of course, it can only go one way where there's these missing pins on the corner and then we'll align it precisely with the pads on the board. All right, and that looks pretty well aligned right there. So I'm gonna go ahead and take the hot air once again, align it over the chip and solder it onto the board. All right, so that looks to be uh, fully soldered right there. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn the heat off and let the chip cool down. All right, so as you can see there, the chip looks to be soldered on successfully. So I'm gonna let the board cool down just a little bit more and then I'll flip it around and we can get the PCH removed and replaced. All right, so as you can see, I've gotten the board all flipped around and in position to desolder the PCH here. So of course, the first thing we need to do is remove the edge bonding around it. All right, and now that that's removed, we can just go ahead and apply some flux to its perimeter and then desolder and remove it. All right, the chip is ready to come off, so we'll go ahead and remove it.
And now, of course, we'll remove the residual solder just like we did before. All right, so that looks about good there. So now we'll just clean the residual flux off and then solder the new chip on. All right, that looks pretty well aligned there. So now we'll just heat it up and solder it on. All right, so the chip looks to be soldered on successfully. So I'm just gonna go ahead and turn off the heat and let it cool down. All right, so as you can see here, everything is now soldered on correctly. You can see we've got our 2012 um, Ivy Bridge PCH soldered on right there. And as you can see here, we've got our Ivy Bridge Core i7-3720QM soldered on right there. So the last step we need to do, and this is based on my assumptions essentially, is we need to dump the SPI ROM of the 2012 logic board that we took both this PCH and CPU from and then flash it onto this board. Now, like I said, I don't know if this is gonna work at all really, um, but in theory it should because, well, the BIOS does match both of these, these uh, pieces of hardware here. However, there might be other differences on the board that I am not taking into account when I flash that firmware on here. But we're gonna go ahead and try it anyway. Um, there's no harm in trying, of course. So the first thing I need to do is get the 2012 board hooked up to the EEPROM programmer here, and then from there we can dump it and then flash it onto this board. All right, as you can see here, I've gotten the 2012 MacBook Pro logic board hooked up to my EEPROM programmer here. And I did have to rig up this quite janky power supply setup here. Um, and the reason for this is because the uh, ICSP port on my EEPROM programmer here cannot supply enough current to power the entire 3.3 volt rail of this system. So that, so in that case, I do have to inject power using this power supply here. As you can see, it's actually already pulling um, 0 .7, 0 0.07 amps there. Um, so I've got the EEPROM programming software open here. So we're just gonna go up to read and then select read. And I have already selected the uh, chip type on the board as you can see right there. Um, so it is ready to go. So we'll just wait for this to finish dumping and then we'll be able to flash this dump onto the 2012 or the 2011 MacBook Pro logic board. All right, and as you can see, the EEPROM was read successfully, so we'll go ahead and exit that, select save, and we'll just save it as mbp91donor.bin, just like so. And now we have that dump saved and ready to flash on. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get the 20, 2011 logic board hooked up here, and we'll flash its EEPROM. All right, so as you can see, I've now got the 2011 MacBook Pro logic board hooked up to the EEPROM programmer. Got the power supply on. It's drawing quite a bit more current than the 2012, probably because, well, the PCH and CPU are actually on this board. And now we'll go ahead, and I already did select the chip type, as you can see. And now we'll go ahead and just read the contents of the chip. And this is just as a backup, just in case I need to flash the original firmware back on for whatever reason. Uh, I can do so. So go ahead and wait for this to dump. All right, and now that that's saved, we can go ahead and save this as MBP83 upgraded original dot bin. All right, so now we know that that is saved properly. So now we'll go ahead and load the MacBook Pro 9,1 dump that we just made here. There it is, mbp91donor.bin. Go ahead and load that up here. And we'll go ahead and select program. 
So this will take quite some time to complete, so we'll just go ahead and wait for that. All right, and as you can see, the programming was successful. Let's go ahead and turn the power supply off here. And now all that's left is to get the heat sink reinstalled on this board, of course, with some fresh thermal paste, and then put it in the machine and see if it actually works. So we'll go ahead and get it assembled, and then we'll give it a test. All right, so as you can see here, I have gotten the uh, logic board all reassembled. I got the heat sink on, thermal paste and whatnot, and I have gone ahead and installed it in the uh, chassis. Uh, but unfortunately, as you might have guessed, the uh, MacBook Pro 9,1 firmware did actually not work properly on this board. Now, I say it didn't work properly, but it did sort of work. And basically what it would do was, when you turn it on, it would take a while to post, first off. It would, like, turn the fan, turn the board off and on, like, five or six times. Um, and then, eventually, it would actually post and chime. However... Um, there was no video on the display, the onboard video wasn't working, um, and a bunch of other things weren't working as well. And that is simply because the 2012 board, the MacBook Pro 9,1 board, uh, has the GPIO of the PCH uh, configured in a much different way than the 2011 machines. So unfortunately, due to that, uh, we cannot use the stock MacBook Pro 9,1 firmware. And of course, it also didn't boot at all with the original uh, MacBook Pro 8,3 firmware because that doesn't have any support for this uh, HM77 PCH or the Ivy Bridge CPU. So what I've gone ahead and done, and it's actually quite a, quite a bit of time later than the uh, last clip that you just saw, uh, but what I've done is I've spent uh, a good amount of time porting over a copy of Core Boot which is sort of like an open source EFI implementation for um, Intel and AMD platforms and even ARM and some other platforms as well uh, they support. But um, I've spent some time porting it over to this and I've gotten most of the machine working at this point. Um, there are a few things that still need to be tweaked and to be modified a little bit to work uh, a little bit better than they do now. Uh, but in the state that it's in now, it is a fully functional machine. It boots into Mac OS and works exactly as intended. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get the bottom cover on this machine. Um, and we'll go ahead and power it on and see how it works with the new hardware installed. Alright, so as you can see here, I've gotten the machine plugged in. So let's go ahead and power it on. And as you can see, it's loading up into Core Boot here. I'll go ahead and show you this menu real quick. So you can see right there it detects the Core i7-3720QM CPU that we installed. Of course, this is a 17-inch machine with a now an Ivy Bridge CPU installed. And um, yeah, this is basically um, one of the payloads you can use with uh, Core Boot. Um, this is the UEFI payload, uh, Tyano Core, I think is what it's called. Um, so we'll go ahead and just reboot it here and let it boot into Open Core. Um, because, the, of course, since this is now running uh, custom firmware, um, we now actually have to Hackintosh it to make it work properly, which is kind of hilarious. Uh, but anyway, um, now that this is a 2012 spec machine, basically, I need to boot off of my unpatched Catalina volume instead of the patched one uh, that I booted off on the original hardware configuration. So as you can see, it's booting up here. And we are now booted into Catalina. So let's go ahead and log in here. As you can see already, we've got full graphics acceleration uh, with no patches applied, which means, of course, that we are now using Intel HD Graphics 4000, which, of course, is a metal-compatible video card. So as you can see there, we've got all the specs listed. We've got the 2.6 gigahertz uh, quad-core Intel Core i7, which is, of course, uh, the 3720QM. You can see we've got six gigs of RAM installed, and that's actually because I had to use different RAM uh, because Core Boot, for some reason, is quite picky about what RAM you can use. Um, I might try to modify that and see if I can fix that. But as you can see here, it's also running at only 666 megahertz. At least that's what OS X sees it as. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, 
Yeah, it seems to be running just fine, even if that is the actual speed it's running at, but it might just be cosmetic, of course. Um, so let's go ahead into system report and take a look at more system info. So as you can see here, I've set the SM BIOS in open core to be a MacBook Pro 9,1, which of course represents this hardware most accurately. Um, you can see all the specs there. And then of course, if we head on over to graphics and displays, we've got the Intel HD Graphics 4000 there with metal supported. So of course we could run up to Ventura on this patch uh, using OpenCore Legacy Patcher. Um, since of course we're already running OpenCore, uh, that would definitely be a possibility on this machine. So I guess the last thing we'll do here is go ahead and open up Geekbench and then we will run the final benchmark results or at least can see the final benchmark results. So let's go ahead and run the benchmarks now. So of course this will take quite some time to complete, so I'll go ahead and resume the video once the Geekbench has completed. All right, so as you can see here, the Geekbench has completed successfully. And as you can see here, we've got a single core score of 582 and a multi-core score of 2381. Now if we compare that with the original score, you can see the improvement is actually not that high. In fact, the single core score is lower than the original score uh, with the original hardware. And uh, the reason for this is because I haven't fully gotten uh, the power management working for the CPU uh, in uh, uh, core boot and open core yet. Um, so it is gonna run a little bit slower than it would um, until I get that fixed fully, which of course I will do later. Um, I just already spent so much time on this. I just wanted to get uh, these final test results done and make sure everything worked as intended. Um, so yeah, um, not the best Geekbench improvement, but still a little bit of an, of an improvement nonetheless. Of course, that will increase uh, once I fully complete my port of uh, core boot to this machine. So the last thing I wanted to show you here is something quite funny that I realized uh, just a minute ago after I was messing with this. If we go to uh, USB in System Profiler here, you can see that the machine actually now has a USB 3.0 bus. However, because this board was never designed to use USB 3, the pins, the extra six pins, I think, or six or seven pins, I forget, uh, for USB 3.0, aren't actually routed out on the board at all. And in fact, it actually just goes straight into a USB 2.0 hub anyway. So even though the PCH has USB 3 support, uh, you can't actually make any use of it on this board because of course it was never designed for it. Um, so with that, that is the completed upgrade from a late 2011 17-inch MacBook Pro to a kind of mid-2012 spec um, 17 inch MacBook Pro. So it is quite a cool upgrade to do. Um, definitely quite a unique upgrade for sure. And uh, yeah, this is a real mid 2012 spec uh, 17 inch MacBook Pro now. So with that, I hope you enjoyed this video.